That's the law of the jungle. And that's what they're teaching you. Ten minutes, right? Yes. <laughs> that's what they're teaching you when they're telling you this kind of nonsense. In fact, modern slavery began in certain moments of history, I was trying to explain to you, with certain logics, certain forms of domination that were different from other civilizations. Okay? And I'm not saying uh, we need to account for those differences. You cannot just collapse history in this crazy way. Okay? And so, uh, and the same thing, racism. There was no racism before European expansion to the Americas. That's a modern phenomenon that didn't exist before. But the Europeans love to say, no, we did not invent racism. That was there since the Greece or since the, I don't know what. And then they would show you a text of someone over there, and they would read it anachronically. That is, you start reading texts to the past with the lenses of today. When the meanings at the time have a completely different meaning from the meaning of today. Get the point? So if you read a text that is Judeophobic in the medieval times, that also means it was racial. You need to understand the logic of that term in that context and how it shifted later in a different way. You see, this is what we need to historicize the thing. You cannot just read texts in the past and say, oh look, the Greeks were talking about civilized and barbarian. You see, they were racist already. No, civilized and barbarian, they have a completely different connotation than the connotation has today. We cannot go with our Eurocentric common sense of today and then look at the past and make sweeping statements that are transhistorical like that. We need to historicize these things. Okay? And so, if they began, they could have an end. You, you get the point? That doesn't mean they're, they're eternal or it's human nature. Okay? They, they began at a certain point in history and they will end at a certain point in history. Okay? That means you can transform these things. They're not fixed. Okay? So, uh, then you have uh, the conquest of Africa where you have the impossibility for the, the people enslaved in the Americas to be uh, to practice their spiritualities and knowledges, okay, and then you have a four genocide epistemic. I mean, we're talking about millions of Africans killed in the process of kidnapping, millions of Africans killed in the process of transportation. I mean, you can imagine how those boats were, trans, you know, just look for books out there. They're, they're uh, you know horrible, and uh, and and then the, the millions of people killed. African skill in the Americas in the process of enslavement there. So it's a process of genocide, of killing and destruction of population. This is very well documented by Walter Rodney, the Caribbean scholar who was in Tanzania. This, uh, this classical work called How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. And he goes in detail about all this stuff and how the first commodity of exportation of Africa was what? human beings. It was not cacao, was not sugar, was not was human beings. Europeans went there to kidnap human beings to be sold in the Americas and to enslave them there. You see? So the first commodity of exportation were human beings. Kidnapped over there. Okay? And they depopulated a lot of Africa. They transformed the economy with this kidnapping industry. Okay? Then they put People to fight each other, okay? Because you know, I don't want to be enslaved, so I enslave this one to sell it to them. I mean, all this crazy divide and rule stuff, okay? Etc. Read Walter Ronnie. This is an amazing book, okay? Uh, then uh, you have a four genocide epistemicide, which is the burning alive of women in Europe accused of being witches in the thousands, okay? Not a few hundred here or there. In the thousands, if not in the millions. All of this is happening at the same time between 1450 and 1650. The conquest of Al-Andalus, the conquest of the Americas, the conquest of Africa, and the conquest of women in Europe. Genocide epistemicide against Muslim and Jews in the conquest of Al-Andalus, Genocide epistemicide against indigenous people in the Americas, in the conquest of the Americas. Genocide epistemicide against African people in the conquest of Africa and mass enslavement in the Americas. 
genocide, epistemicide against women in Europe accused of being witches. Who were these women? Indigenous women from this part of the world. These were this woman. They were very empowered. They had a lot of uh, uh, ancestral knowledge because it was transmitted from generation to generation in moral ways. Okay? <clears throat> and they were uh, sages of communities. They knew a lot about astronomy, medicine, plants, all kinds of stuff. Okay? When I say indigenous today in our racist imaginary, immediately we think about dark skinned women. Right? No, these are blonde haired, blue eyed women. <laughs> But I call them indigenous not because of the color of skin. That's not what defines indigeneity. Okay? That's, that would be calling back, you know, going back to racist definitions, right? What defines indigeneity is the way of living, their cosmovision, the relationship between human life and other forms of life. Okay? This, this is what I'm calling indigeneity, this, this indigenous woman with practices of you know, a relationship with the other forms of life, with the universe, etc. That was not dualistic, we're heuristic. Okay? And I explained these dualistic structures in the previous uh, 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 lecture uh, and the opposition, how they, they destruct <coughs> the, the, the imposition of dualistic structure in Christendom and destruction of heuristic concepts in the colonization of their cultures, okay? And how devastating this is for many things, including life in planet Earth, okay? And so, uh, uh, <clears throat> so they, they went after them big time, and it was a mass killing of women in Europe. And here you have, and of course, in their case, there were no books to burn because it was oral history, transmission of ancestral knowledges that was matrilineal. The books were their bodies. And so instead of burning libraries, they burned their bodies because they were the books. Get the point? So they burned them alive. Like they were burning books in Alandal, burning the books of the uh, in, 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 in the Americas of the indigenous civilization, here they were burning the bodies of this woman because there was no book. The books were the bodies. They were the carriers of the knowledge. Okay? So here you have four genocide epistemicides that were at the, are at the foundation of the modern structures of knowledge. Why am I saying that? In 1640, you have René Descartes Consider the founder of modern European philosophy and sciences. Okay? <clears throat> Here you have René Descartes, 1640s. And he is producing a famous book called Discourse on Methods. And in this book, he's, he talks about I think, therefore I exist. Which is nonsense, but let's keep going. I don't have time to go <laughs> I mean, how could you, I think, and then I say, oh, anyway, I exist, therefore I think. I mean, I mean in any case, but anyway. So, I think, therefore I exist, okay? And then, with this axiom, <coughs> what he meant was the following. What he was trying to do was, he would say that this I is a new foundation of knowledge. So, what he's doing is taking the attributes of the Christian known God and secularizing these attributes into this I. So he will say that this eye is able to produce a knowledge that's universal beyond any particularity. That is truth beyond time and space. Like the Christian non God. If you remember my lecture, Christian non God is floating in the cloud. He's an old European white man with a cane. You know, I explained all of that last time. Watching and you know, surveilling and punishing. So if you misbehave, hit you in the head with a cane. If you keep misbehaving, send you to hell. Okay? So this is the Christian language. It's, it's a fetish, idolatric concept because a European man, white man, watching you from a cloud, right? So he takes this image of the. I explained that in detail last time. So those of you interested, check the audio when it's up. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Okay. I'm so hard. Anyway. <laughs> and then, 
uh, what happened is that uh, there were this this concept of this uh, unsituated God, okay, that is floating in a cloud, watching everybody, that is human-like, and especially like a European white man of all age, right? Uh, this image is going to take these attributes of this God and put it in this eye. And he will say, this eye, we don't need God anymore. We have in this eye all the attributes of the Christian known God, because this eye is going to be able to produce a truth beyond time and space, objectivity as neutrality, and a universal knowledge beyond any particularity. Sound familiar? We're still producing knowledge in the Western University based on this mythology. In Western University, we use the Cartesian mythology, these attributes, a knowledge that is a universal beyond any particularity, truth beyond time and space, and objectivity and neutrality. This mythology is, is a complete nonsense. But uh, this mythology is used to, to define the criteria from what is sign, science and what is not science. Still today, still today they still use this, okay? Especially in the social science, because in the natural sciences, in many fields they have gone beyond this, okay? But still the, natural, the social science caught in this, and humanities in many ways. But anyway, uh, so the question is, in order to make the argument, he said then that this eye can produce a good eye view. God eye view. And a, a knowledge that is equivalent to God. A God eye view. Because it's a knowledge that is beyond any particularity, universal, that is a objective, being neutral, and beyond time, truthful beyond time and space. So it's God-like. Now to make the argument that this I produce a God-like knowledge, he needs two other arguments. The first one is ontological dualism. He needs to claim that the mind is like the Christian non God that I explained in the last lecture, is floating in a cloud and is undetermined by a body. So he needs ontological dualism. That he needs to claim that the mind is separate from the body, as different substance. Two different substances. What if human beings produce knowledge or think from a body? Then the whole argument about a God, a God, a God I view falls apart. Because that means that you're thinking from a particularity in the world. Because your body is situated in time and space. Now you cannot claim a God I view. Get the point? That's why he needs the ontological dualism to be able to claim that the mind is floating in a cloud like the Christian God and therefore is undetermined by any particularity, undetermined by time and space, and therefore the mind can produce a God I view, like a, a knowledge equivalent to God. This is the idolatric concept of the I think, therefore I exist. The shirk concept, okay? it's a shirk concept. Because now it's turning human beings into God-like. Get the point? And now, the next thing is, the next thing, I cannot wrap up, I'm sorry. <laughs> so the next thing is... <laughs> At some is, point it will kick us out. <laughs> I'm sorry. So the next thing is that next argument he needs is methodological solipsism. That is the idea that you get to certitude in knowledge through an internal monologue of the, of the subject with himself. And I say himself on purpose, okay? Because it's a male. You'll see in a minute. So, in an internal monologue with himself, <coughs> asking questions, answering questions, until finally getting to certitude in knowledge. What if human beings produce knowledge not through an internal monologue with himself, but through dialogic relationship with other human beings? Then the God I view falls apart. Because that means that you produce knowledge in a particular moment in history, in a particular society, etc. And then you cannot produce a knowledge universal beyond any particularity or truthful beyond time and space, because you're not beyond time and space. You are in a, in a 
concrete space in a body, in a, in a concrete society, etc., in history, then you cannot produce a knowledge that is objective and neutrality. Get the point? So he needs these two arguments, methodological solipsism and ontological dualism. But then here comes the question. That is the question raised by Enrique Dussel back in the 60s, okay, the philosopher of liberation of Latin America. Okay. It's a recent question by, posed by feminists too, in the, especially in the 80s, you know, but this was posed way before by Enrique Dussel in Latin America, a philosopher of liberation, who said, who the hell is this Descartes? Let's situate Descartes instead of from where he's thinking from. What is the geopolitics of knowledge of René Descartes? Who is Descartes? So he starts situating Descartes. And then he comes to the conclusion, first, Descartes was theorizing from where? From Amsterdam. He was French, but he was theorizing all this book from Amsterdam. At a moment when Amsterdam, after the 30-year war, had displaced the Albinian Peninsula from the center of this new world civilization that they have created with expansion to Al-Andalus and the Americas, right? And now the Dutch comes at the new hegemon okay, of the system. And that's from where he's thinking. And he's saying, the car is the imperial being. This is the imperial being talking and speaking. And he's thinking from the location, the geopolitical knowledge. I mean, how come you could have, you know, what are the conditions of possibility for an idolatric, I think, okay, in the mid 17th century? Well, he says the I think, it says Dussel, is preceded by 150 years of I conquer, therefore I exist. So the foundation of the idolatric I think, of this I that thinks of himself as a superior being on planet Earth and equivalent to God, right, is 150 years, 1492, 1642. 150 years of I conquer, therefore I exist. So it's the I conquer the condition of possibility for the idolatric I think. But here I'm going to add a supplement to Dussel's argument because there's been many I conquer in world history, but none of them have ended up in an idolatric I think. Why this one? of all the I conquering world history ended up in an idolatric I think. There is some mediation there missing. And the mediation is the mediation between the I conquer and the idolatric I think is I exterminate therefore I exist. The four genocide epistemicides of the long 16th century. That's what turned the I conquer into the idolatric I think. When you exterminate knowledge and populations. And put yourself as a god I as, as a godlike figure on planet Earth, you see, by exterminating all these other people. Why I'm saying that? Oh professor, that's a very problematic argument. Well, when he was writing in the sixth seventeenth century. I think, therefore I exist. Nobody in Amsterdam, France, Spain, any place in Europe would dare to say that that I is a Muslim after the conquer of Al-Andalus. Is a Jew after the conquer of Al-Andalus. Nobody dare to say that. Nobody dare to say that that I is black, African, after the conquer of Africa. Nobody dare to say that I is an indigenous person after the conquest of the Americas. Nobody there to say that, that I could be a woman, not even a woman of the five countries in Europe. Who is left? In the common sense of the time, shaped by the four genocide epistemics of the long 16th century, it was in the common sense already established that that I can only be a white man. There were, nobody else could be the I after all this genocide epistemicide. That's why I'm saying the I exterminate, therefore I exist, is the mediation between the I conquer, therefore I exist, and the idolatric I think, therefore I am. OK? 
get the point? So this is why I'm saying that these four genocide epistemics are at the foundation of the patriarchal and racist structures of the modern world and are constitutive of the knowledge structures that we have until today. But we, the, we never say, you know what, when someone asks you, what are you doing? You say, well, I'm studying sociology in the university, you know, uh, and I'm studying a degree and I'm studying scientific social theory, etc. You don't say, I study in a Western university, colonial sociology, uh, through epistemic racist, sexist, a canon of thought or knowledge structure. You don't say that when someone asks you. Did you get the point? We don't say that. I'm learning epistemic racism, sexism in my, in my university to become a colonial sociology uh, with, for a PhD in a westernized university. Did you get the point? So we don't say that because you know why? Because the memory and the connection between the four genocide epistemic sites and the structural knowledge of the modern world and the Western university are disconnected in our memory. We don't make the connections. Not even the people who study this genocide epistemic have made the connections. If you read the people talk, writing about the witch hunting in Europe, they don't connect with the conquest of Orlando. Or people writing about conquest of Orlando, they don't connect with the conquest of America. People, you see what I mean? It's all fragmented and disconnected. But when you put the whole thing together, and you see that this is happening at the same time, at the same moment, you say, wait a minute, what's going on here? By the same people. The same people are burning women here, are the same one enslaving people in Africa. And are the same one uh, con conquering and uh, exterminating indigenous people in America, etc. You know, it's the same people, the same groups, the same elites, the same dominant groups. And so, how come we don't make, this is very obvious, this is very obvious, I'm not saying anything that you cannot see. How come the same people are doing all these genocide epistemicide in all these different places and we don't make the connections? Because they're not going to tell you that, they're not going to write a history putting the whole pieces together. That's how white men got the privilege in knowledge production. It was not because they were having this, uh, how can I say, uh, 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 enlightenment. It was because they basically crushed everybody else, destroyed their civilization, destroyed their structures of knowledge production, appropriated the knowledge from the rest of the world, epistemic extractivism, right? And then carry on the project of science, philosophy, on their own. You know, and then starting feudalizing everybody else, and through colonialism, start destroying the infrastructure, knowledge production of the rest of humanity, and then feudalizing them at the not only social economic level but at the epistemic level too. So now, hundred years later, you have Immanuel Kant, and Immanuel Kant, and I'm going to finish. So Immanuel Kant. No, is that if I don't finish the whole thing, then I, it's, it's just, I have to finish this. So you have Immanuel Kant, 100 years later, saying in his anthropological writings that, 100 years later from Descartes, saying that the, super, the, the rationality is in the white man north of the Pyrenees Mountain. You know the Pyrenees Mountain? They divide the Iberian Peninsula from the south of France. So, Rationality is there, the white man north of the Pyrenees Mountain. Yellow man have no rationality, black man have no rationality, red man 